Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Joe finally set down the last box. Moving day was complete. He tossed his set of keys on the coffee table and plopped down on the couch, exhausted. His dog was scratching at the door, but Joe figured this was just him getting used to the new place. Joe turned on the TV and started flipping through the channels trying to find the Monday night football game. The Colts were playing, and Joe was excited to see if they could finally clinch a playoff spot. As he flipped through the channels, his dog wouldn't stop scratching at the door. Get away from there, he called out, but the dog wouldn't let up. Joe figured he'd let the dog outside, but with the property being new and unfamiliar, he didn't want to just let the dog roam around and get himself lost. Joe let out a sigh and grabbed the dog's leash. They opened the door and made their way down the steps into the yard. As they walked around, waiting for his dog to do his business, he thought he saw someone walking through the tree line. This must be another unwanted guest, he thought to himself. Trespassers were not uncommon on the property. A string of crimes happened in this very house, and tourists frequently came by uninvited trying to get a glimpse of the scene of the crime. As Joe made his way closer to promptly kick the man out, he saw him again. The man was wearing a red shirt and seemingly gliding from tree to tree. That guy moves like a ghost, he thought to himself. As he picked up the pace, he saw the man again. He was wearing a red shirt, but he couldn't quite see his legs. That's odd, he thought to himself. As he got another glimpse of the man, he was shocked to realize that he could see straight through his legs, almost as if they weren't even there. From the waist down, this man seemed to be invisible. I must be seeing things, Joe thought to himself, but it became clear that his dog saw whatever this was too. The dog started barking and then took off running after the man. Fearing for his dog's safety, Joe gave chase. As he ran through the trees, there was his dog, but the dog wasn't running anymore. The dog was staring back at him, wide-eyed, shaking. Joe stopped as he felt a presence behind him. Joe slowly turned around and standing directly in front of him was the spirit of a man with a red shirt, and he was invisible from the waist down. And just like that, he vanished. I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, The Haunting of Fox Hollow Farm. In the early 1990s, Fox Hollow Farm was purchased on contract by a local business owner. Over the next few years, men around Indianapolis started going missing. Although never convicted, the owner of the Tudor-style country mansion became the prime suspect in a string of murders committed on the property. One day, a boy named Eric was playing in his backyard when he made a gruesome discovery. Lying in a pile of leaves, was a complete human skeleton. Being a curious young man, he grabbed the skull and ran to the house to show his mother. She anxiously awaited the arrival of her husband, who brushed the incident off, claiming that he knew the skeleton was there because he put it there. He explained that his father had been a doctor who owned the skeleton from his days in the medical field. The skeleton had since been given to him and he had kept it in his garage before deciding to bury it. Somehow, his wife believed him. What his wife didn't realize at the time was that she was living with a serial killer, and this skeleton was just one of his many victims whose bones lay strewn about their entire backyard. Indianapolis had a strange and faulty missing persons policy in the 1990s. A person wouldn't be officially declared missing until 30 days after their disappearance. Around this time, more and more men were vanishing. Private investigator Virgil Vandergriff started connecting the dots and was convinced that Indianapolis may have a serial killer on their hands. Detective Mary Wilson had been working on the case, taking notes that gay men in particular had been disappearing from bars around the city. The missing persons were all around the same age, 
and had similar features. Many of these men shared the same background as well. Some were transients or drifters and had little contact with their families. The latest disappearance was what convinced Vandergriff that these events were not just circumstantial. 34-year-old Roger Goodlett visited a gay bar on 16th Street. He was never seen again. Not wanting to wait for the legal process of reporting a missing person, Roger's mother went to Virgil with her son's story. She mentioned his trusting nature and tendency to drink too much as potential reasons why he could have fallen victim to a kidnapping. Vandergriff noticed too many similarities between his case and other missing men to ignore. Virgil and his partner Bill Hillsley investigated by questioning bartenders and customers, but most were hesitant to talk. They did learn that Roger left the bar on 16th Street that night with another man, but only received vague details about the suspect's appearance. They did describe his vehicle as possibly being a light blue car with an Ohio license plate. This didn't seem to be enough evidence for police to take the case seriously, but Vandergriff wasn't giving up. The following month, he met a man who knew Roger and claimed to have information about his disappearance. The informant not only had seen and spoken with a potential serial killer, but he may have been the only one of his victims to escape. The informant made multiple visits to Vandergriff's office, giving more and more details every time. He had met the suspect at the 501 Club one night. He described the man as tall, lanky, and silent. This tall man was standing by Roger Goodlett's missing persons poster, scrutinizing it, almost obsessing over it. The informant claimed that his demeanor and actions led him to believe that this man must know something about his friend Roger's disappearance and may have even had something to do with it. So he struck up a conversation, hoping to find out more. The man introduced himself as Brian Smart. Brian claimed to be a landscape artist who was living at the vacant home and invited him back to the house for a swim and a drink. They left the club and got into Brian's gray Buick. The vehicle had an Ohio license plate. They headed north on I-31. The informant remembered that they were entering into rich people area. And after pulling up a long winding driveway, they arrived at a sprawling Tudor style country mansion. The property was dark, but the informant managed to catch a quick glimpse of a sign, which he only remembered as saying something farm. The two men entered the house through a side entrance. Brian led him to the basement, to a large recreation room with a wet bar and pool. Under different circumstances, this may have seemed like a great place to hang out, if it weren't for one unsettling factor. Mannequins had been positioned all around the pool. They were propped up, almost as if they were human, posing as if they were enjoying a party, sharing drinks, or lounging by the water. Brian noticed that the man was uncomfortable looking around at all the mannequins. I get lonely down here. They give me company, Brian said, which did not make the man feel any less uncomfortable. Brian offered him a drink, which he refused, as he was becoming more and more uneasy with the ongoing situation. He had taken Brian up on his offer to find out if this man was a serial killer, and he was quickly realizing that he may be in over his head. The two went for a swim, and Brian was extremely talkative, but suddenly his demeanor changed. Brian grabbed the pool hose and told him that he had just learned a new trick. The trick was erotic asphyxiation, and Brian wanted to test it out. Horrified, the man agreed. It was becoming clear that this wasn't a new trick for Brian and that he had done this many times. Brian tied the hose around his neck and he immediately knew that Brian wasn't going to stop. So he pretended to go unconscious and Brian eventually loosened his grip. Brian paused, whispered his name and then began shaking him violently. When he opened his eyes, Brian was enraged. The informant attempted to get a confession out of him. Was this what you did to Roger? Did he play your little game? But he said nothing and just looked at him and grinned. Eventually, Brian Smart passed out, likely from alcohol and drugs. The man took the opportunity to search the house, looking for clues about who he really was. Unable to find any sort of identification, he woke the man up and convinced him to drive him back into town. After agreeing to meet the following Wednesday, the exhausted Brian agreed and actually drove the man back. The informant didn't know the address and only had a vague description of the house, which was little to work with, but Vandergriff was determined. As the following Wednesday approached, Vandergriff stationed one of his men outside the bar, but Brian Smart never showed. 
They went to the police, who had previously wrote the story off as nonsense. But this time, Detective Mary Wilson was ready to listen. She told the informant to get Brian's license plate number, and they would take it from there. Mary contacted a psychic named Wanda, whose visions made her shudder. She claimed to see a man handcuffed to a bed, being strangled, with his tongue swollen and eyes bulging out of his head. And she warned that the man should never return to that house. Vandergriff dispatched Bill Hisley, who knew the area, and he searched the country suburbs. Finally, he had a hit. At the end of one of the driveways read a sign, Fox Hollow Farm. He remembered that the informant had described the sign outside of the driveway reading something farms. The house vaguely matched the description, and the house belonged to a family called the Baumeisters. Almost a year into the search for this Brian Smart, they finally had a breakthrough. The suspect stopped by the Varsity Lounge on August 29th, 1995, and at the bar happened to be the informant. The two struck up a conversation, and as Brian left, the man followed him outside and managed to write down the license plate of the vehicle as he pulled away. The license plate did not belong to a man named Brian Smart, but to a man named Herbert Baumeister. Herb lived in an estate called Fox Hollow Farm, which had a swimming pool in the basement. Police approached Herb at one of his doors, explaining that he was a prime target in their investigation into missing gay men in the area. They asked to search his property, which he immediately refused, and he told them that any further communication would have to go through his lawyer. Mary decided to take a different approach, and she contacted his wife, Julie. She was also stubborn and initially refused. When Mary informed Julie that her husband was under investigation for being a serial killer, Julie's attitude changed, but she still refused to allow them to search the property. Six months later, in June of 1996, as their marriage failed and they both began divorce proceedings, Julie had become more and more concerned with Herb's erratic behavior and mood swings. She came to her senses and told her lawyer to contact Mary. She took the opportunity to inform detectives about the skeleton that had been discovered in the backyard. She brought the authorities to the location where the human remains had been found, and as detectives began exploring the property, they came across a burned bone. They first dismissed it as likely being that of an animal, but as they looked around at what they first thought were rocks and sticks, they began to realize that they were standing in a makeshift graveyard of bone fragments. At one point, one detective realized that he was stepping on a set of human teeth. They submitted their large bag of evidence to forensic anthropologist Stephen Norwalki, who quickly confirmed that these bones were recent, they had been burned, and they were human. It became clear that Herbert Baumeister had likely been responsible for many of the missing men around Indianapolis. More authorities joined in the dig efforts in the backyard of Fox Hollow Farm. As the dig continued, they also searched the home and found a hidden camera in the pool area. They suspected that Herb may have been filming his crimes. Compost piles and a burn pit in the backyard turned up more human remains. 60 volunteers assisted in the efforts, discovering over 5,000 bone fragments. They estimated at the time that it came from at least four or five bodies. Further searches revealed that bones were also discovered on the neighbor's property, likely dragged away by animals. A drainage ditch divided the two yards, and this ditch was full of human ribs and vertebrae. The bones were sticking up visibly from the mud. They also found handcuffs and empty cans of Miller, which happened to be Herb's favorite beer. At this point, they estimated that the body count was up to 11, but would later conclude that at least 19 bodies were scattered around Fox Hollow Farm. Authorities were only able to identify four of these victims from their dental records. Roger Goodlett, Stephen Hale, Richard Hamilton, and Manuel Resendez. But where was the prime suspect? While the search was going on, he had been on vacation with his kids, but he had seemingly vanished just like his victims. Brad Baumeister, Herb's brother, informed police that Herb was on the run. He had been contacting Brad looking for money. The fugitive made his way to Canada. On July 2nd, a mounted police officer noticed a man sleeping in his car under a bridge. She approached the vehicle and asked the man inside why he was sleeping in his car. Herb Baumeister explained that he was traveling and wanted to get a few moments sleep. She noticed that in the back seat of his car was luggage and a box of videotapes. According to authorities, on July 3rd, Herb put a 357 Magnum to his forehead and pulled the trigger. He left a three-page suicide note, which mentioned nothing of the murders. 
The box of tapes was not in his vehicle when his body was discovered and has never been found. Eyewitnesses who first responded to the scene of his suicide described his body as though it had looked like it had been placed there. The sand around his corpse was smoothed out. His skin looked waxy, almost as though he had makeup on, as if his body had been prepared, somewhat comparable to how a body would look at a funeral. He was very well dressed. His eyes and mouth were wide open. Two strangled seagulls were laid out next to his body, side by side. All three dead bodies were pointed out towards the water. The death was ruled a suicide via self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head, but those who responded to the scene did not see a gun. This led many to believe that Herb Baumeister may have been executed, with many of his belongings, including the box of videotapes, being removed from his vehicle. Some speculate that this may have been a ritualistic killing due to the dead birds and strategic placement of his body. This is one theory as to why his former home is now said to be haunted. Over a six month period, six different paranormal investigation teams investigated Fox Hollow Farms to verify the hauntings. The Ghost Adventures team also investigated the home. Many visitors to the property believe that the spirits of his victims and even Herb's ghost still haunt the property. The first ghost sighting at the farm was by one of the new owners, Vicki Graves. One day, she noticed a young man wandering through their backyard. Assuming it was another uninvited guest trying to get a glimpse of the scene of so many murders, or maybe someone hunting for bones in the backyard, she stepped out to get a closer look and ask him to leave. She noticed that the man was walking directly towards a tree. If he continued on this path, he would have walked straight into it. But before he did, the man vanished. He was wearing a red shirt, but what was more chilling was that from his waist down, the man was invisible. Later that same night, Joe LeBlanc, the former tenant who rented the guest house on the property, not only saw the ghost in the red shirt as well, but so did his dog, who immediately chased after the spirit. Many believe that this red-shirted ghost was trying to lead strangers to his final resting place, which may not have yet been discovered. During the first night that Joe moved into the guest house, he had a terrifying dream that somebody was chasing him through the woods. The dream was so realistic that Joe jumped to his feet half awake and he ran directly into a door frame, knocking him down, shattering a glass in the process. Joe claimed that in his apartment, the locked door leading outside shot open so violently that it left a hole in the wall. When he went out to see who kicked open the door, nobody was there. He also claimed that on multiple occasions, he would hear knocking at the door. Whenever he would check to see who was visiting him at odd hours in the night, nobody was there. The knocking was the same distinct sound that came from the door knocker. One night, the knocking grew louder and louder, and it was consistent. The knocking wouldn't stop, and the pounding was so hard that the door itself was shaking. Joe opened the door and stepped outside. Once again, nobody was there. As he turned to make his way back inside, he noticed that the door knocker was standing straight up. To his astonishment, the door knocker slammed down one more time. When he went back into the apartment, he saw a man standing in his apartment. The man was dressed in all white and he was soaked from head to toe. The man was staring right at him with terror on his face. He then turned and walked into the bedroom. But when Joe followed to see who this visitor was, the man was gone. Joe was convinced that something was haunting the guest house. This wasn't the only ghost to visit him in his apartment. He also claimed that he and his dog saw some sort of figure dashing around his apartment. The figure ran into the bathroom, put both of his hands on the wall, stopped and looked at him and then dashed out. The most terrifying ghostly encounter that would happen to Joe would be in the pool. One day, he was going for a swim when someone or something wrapped its cold fingers around his neck. Joe thrashed around in the pool, thinking he was being pranked or attacked by one of the members of the Grave family. But when he finally broke free of its grasp, the terrified family was looking on from the edges of the pool. Joe was in the middle. There was no way anyone could have swam up to him or that far away from him in that short amount of time. Whatever tried to strangle Joe in the pool that day was not human. One of the tactics used by paranormal investigators in the home was filming the ripples of water in the pool. 
This was believed to be the location where Herb murdered many of his victims. It's theorized that within these ripples, you can sometimes capture images of spirits who are trapped in the area. Several of these pictures capture what looked to be the image of a face, possibly in its final moments before being choked to death or drowning. According to the book, The Horrors of Fox Hollow Farms by Richard Estep with Robert Graves, Richard's paranormal investigation team captured a ton of terrifying evidence. Class A EVPs, as well as figures dashing around the pool, with several captured on SLS cameras. Several members of his team were poked and jabbed by unseen forces, mostly centered around the pool or the pump room. Shadow figures have been seen moving through the woods, and they are not shy. They will stop in their tracks and stare at visitors. EVPs capture horrifying laughter from the woods and endless intelligent responses. Years after the investigation, bones still turn up at Fox Hollow Farm. One day, Joe LeBlanc was walking his dog in the backyard, near the area where he had seen the red shirt ghost. As he made his way to the exact spot where the ghost had vanished, he noticed something sitting on the path. He made his way closer and discovered a human femur bone laying out in the open. How could something be left out in the open for so long and go completely unnoticed? Joe believes that someone wanted that bone to be found. I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Fox Hollow Farm, Carmel, Indiana. Welcome, everybody, to Hometown Ghost Stories. Tonight, you get me as your host, as Jesse Wilkins is on vacation. He still might be joining us. I am joined tonight, however, by Hometown Hometown Ghost Stories' very own mannequin, Dave Wilkins. Yeah, I was wondering wondering how you were going to talk some shit to me in the opening. So I I always find a way. And we also have, back by popular demand, Catherine Wilkins, who has joined us previously. Hello. I cannot wear my hat backwards, but I did wear a hat for tonight. It's we appreciate mandatory. It. It's part of the dress code mm-hmm. here at Hometown Ghost Stories. You have to wear a hat to really encompass the feel of the show. And um, you did it. So thank you for that. Anyway, if, uh, if you don't adhere to the very strict hat dress code, we will force a pirate hat on you. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. <laughs> we can Not the do pirate that. hats. We can do the pirate hats. So we are back to talking about a haunted location because of a serial killer, which is kind of intersecting everything that I like in terms of a, a good haunting. I know Catherine's very into this as well. We're talking about Fox Hollow Farm and um, not a story I was familiar with. Were you guys familiar with this one? No, I actually wasn't. And then Jesse sent it over. He's, he was he mentioned that he was reading a book about it. And I was uh, I want to go try and pick up the book, but ended up not doing that. Um, but I might still in the future. But no, so this was the first time I had actually looked into it. I had definitely heard of the the murders, but I didn't hear about the haunting part of the property. But I ended up watching all of the shows and even the documentary that Jesse was talking about. And um, I'm caught up. What I found interesting when I was doing my own independent look into this case is I thought when I was going to look into it, I was only going to find stuff on the killings, right? Like it was going to be all about the serial killer, but overwhelmingly a lot of the stuff that popped up included the hauntings this is one of those cases that they mesh together pretty evenly when you start to look into this case yeah the hauntings were pretty specific they um i mean we'll we'll, we'll get into the hauntings a little bit in depth in a little bit but um just to say like you don't usually get like specific ghosts all the time you know you might have something happen then you end up with like a residual haunting or like mm-hmm. knocks footsteps you know the usual you know, ghost bingo type stuff. But uh, this one, like with the red shirt guy, which they actually connected to one of the victims that was seen leaving the bar with the red shirt. 
you know, right. that's pretty exact. So you don't see that a lot. And it was pretty interesting to see it in this one. And it's much different than a lot of what we cover because this isn't 1890s, 1900s ghost. This is recent. Like this happened when within our lifetime, at least mine and yours, Dave, where a lot of this stuff went down. So it's these are more recent hauntings, which is one of the things that people always say. They're like, well, why don't we see ghosts from people today? And it's like, well, you do. You can mm -hmm. still find hauntings. It's just the more prominent ones that are, are the ones with the longer history, right? So this has already been said to be um, one of our little bingo card jokes, one of the most haunted locations in Indiana, whenever you start digging into this place. But it's it's a creepy one. Right. So before we get into it, we should probably uh, say what's up to some of the people in chat. Jesse always does this. And to pay homage to Jesse, we should carry on the tradition. So, of course, what's up to Matthew T and uh, Fox Crown in there? Mariah, I see Bree, the Stephanie's, of course, as always. Uh, what's up to Jesse? Jesse's in the chat today. So that's that's exciting and new. Some new people I saw up earlier that I can't remember. We had Ricardo for a while. So what's up to everybody who stopped in? And oh, um, the Demon King is a new vip patron as of today so yeah. i didn't get the uh graphic because jesse put this together earlier this week but uh big thanks to him that's awesome vip patrons yeah we we'll appreciate all of our patrons we'll shout them all out at the end of the episode where you can also become a patreon member and you're getting a lot of extra content from us this week if you are and i just want to point out some of our patreon members didn't realize that there was extra content on the patreon site so make sure you're checking that. There's a lot of extra videos that no one else is getting access to unless you are a Patreon member. But let's get into the story of Fox Hollow Farm. Catherine, what, when you started looking into this, what, what caught your attention the most? Or I think it was just how many victims he had. Hmm. Like he was able to successfully murder at least 11 people that they know of yeah. and dispose of them pretty much entirely before it was found yeah so i think yeah they got the 11 definite right the 11 confirmed yeah 11 like, confirmed i think jesse mm -hmm. mentioned some so i think jesse mentioned the number 19 but they also connected him to the um the i-70 strangler which mm -hmm. was um an unidentified serial killer who killed at least 12 boys and men in indiana and ohio between june 1680 and october 1991 and uh dumped their bodies near interstate 70 that's how they coined that term but after um Somebody said that they had witnessed one of the victims. Uh, Michael Riley was one of the I-70 Strangler victims leaving the um, bar that Herb Baumeister was seen leaving with some of his victims. Mm -hmm. They pretty much all but concluded that it was the same person, which is uh, pretty interesting. Like they're not they're not going to be able to ever like convict Clarify, him, yeah. right? Like officially, but they're pretty much all but certain, which is pretty interesting. So his number could be very high up in the double digits. It also yeah. lines up with him because he, if he was the I-70 Strangler, he was active from 1980 to 1991, and then he moved to Fox Hollow Farm, bought that property in 1991, and that's when the, the Strangler stopped. Yeah, so that's pretty interesting. Um, so probably, right? I right. I say almost definitely. I think, and I think that's the consensus is that it was pretty much almost de definitely. But uh, this guy was a weirdo. I mean, obviously. <laughs> But yeah. like from the from the get go, like yeah. he started demonstrating odd behavior when he was uh, a young kid in school. He got uh, he got in trouble one day at school for um, he he pissed on his teacher's desk, which is not something <laughs> that you hear of a lot. You always everybody you know, everyone had like the problem child or like the, uh, the class clown. I guess class clown doesn't quite encompass this behavior, but you know everyone had that problem child. But I definitely never saw anybody do anything like this like that well i would like to just point out that my little brother who is part of the the bridgewater episode and i always described him as a hellion as a child there was a morning where i was sitting in my bedroom and i was probably seven or eight years old in that wheelhouse so i had my toy box in my closet and he was mad at me for some reason he's like two three years old at the time and he marches into my bedroom and I just kind of look at him to see what he's doing. And he marches right to my closet. He drops his pants and he starts peeing all in my toy box. And that's when I got rid of my toy box. So I just want to point out that serial killer behavior 
is established by peeing on things and uh my so my little brother is probably also a serial killer. I was gonna say, you're are you trying like your yeah. brother is not a serial killer, correct? That you know of, right? We don't maybe we don't just, know yet. Maybe he just hasn't got caught yet. What does that mean? You don't know yet. <laughs> well, remember, serial yeah, right? killers usually don't start till they're mid to late thirty, so he might be getting ready to start soon. I don't know. If you're uh, located in the western part of the country, just be careful. Don't be around him. He might pee yeah. in your toy box and then kill you. Andrew in the chat over here says you're in for a surprise. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> no. Oh no. Oh no. But yeah, so he was um doing things like that and he was uh he had an obsession with dead animals, uh, which is usually uh um, well, not real always quick, just real I'm sorry to cut you off, but speaking okay. of dead animals, we uh oh. have Jesse Wilkins joining us real quick. That. Heck well, that it is. That looks great. Jesse, why don't you say something to, so we can decide whether or not we're going to keep you here or immediately remove you? All right. All I right, cool. So. Yeah, glad, I think, glad I to think have you here. I think it's my uh, turn. Hello, boys and girls. I heard you guys. Welcome. This is, uh, this, you are de you're derailing the show. So yeah, yeah, goodbye. You're, we got to let you go. You're sound awful and you're derailing the show. <laughs> He always has to be the center of attention, huh? Yeah, he shows up with his palm tree. Get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> take your palm tree with you. We got yeah. this. Um, so the dead animals, Dave. Right. So being obsessed with dead animals, not great. I mean, he wasn't killing the animals that I know of, so you you didn't have that like obvious um, like this is, dude's definitely going to be a serial killer thing going on. But he had uh, he would play with his dead animals a lot, so that was um, something to be concerned about um so he was diagnosed with schizophrenia early on but um his parents didn't seek out any further treatment which i originally thought was kind of weird but the treatment back in the 60s which is when this was when they would have had him diagnosed was mm -hmm. electric shock therapy therapy which most parents were like opting out of you know you don't want to send your kid in to get his brain zapped um so that was i think the case with him so they didn't I think this is, was um, one case where they probably should have exercised that option, you know, in retrospect. Right. But I totally understand not wanting to bring my kid to the hospital to get his brain shocked because he has an imaginary friend. Oh, he's All back. Right. We're going to try this one more time. Jesse, can you hear us? You once we'll again the, we'll derailed the show. Once again. Once again, it's just absolutely derailed the show. Um, anyways. I'm done with this. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> giving, giving up on that. Anyways, Catherine, <laughs> as as our resident dead animal expert, can you confirm that this is part of the uh, culture of the serial killer? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look at like Jeffrey Dahmer and other things, they usually start with animals, mostly their own pets, and then they move on to wild animals when they see that people around them are definitely freaked out by what they like. And then uh, they move on from there and just eventually end up on on humans, unfortunately. Jeffrey Dahmer is an interesting parallel, and you brought him up. And uh, I was recently watching the new Jeffrey Dahmer um, movie, not movie, uh, series on Netflix. And I guess what unless they changed facts, which I don't think they did. I think they pretty much stayed true to the story. He wasn't killing animals when he was a kid either. He was just him and his father would like find dead animals on the road and they would bring them back to their um, garage and just examine them and study them. And he was Jeffrey Dahmer also had an obsession with dead animals, but wasn't necessarily killing them. Same exact thing as her Baumeister. And there are a lot of parallels you can draw between these two serial killers the real, the only real main difference is that uh, Herb Bellmeister was not eating his victims. Definitely that we know not. Of. <laughs> that we know of. They only found the remains. True, but uh, I don't think what I find so this gets a little further ahead. What I find interesting, just because I was going to tie this into Jeffrey Dahmer myself, is when you have these killers like John Wayne Gacy and Jeffrey Dahmer, and they have these massive body counts, right? and it happens on like the property that they're living in or staying in, they immediately tear that location down and Fox hollow farm still stands. I find that very, very intriguing that they decided to keep the property up. Well, somebody else bought it. Right. So that's where a lot of the ghost stories are coming from is the new people who bought the, the house. So, 
Um, that's, yeah, but but they usually find a reason to tear down the property and like rebuild or something like that, where they kept the actual house up this time. Yeah, well, it's between, tough. Well, oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. Between the the graves and um, the Bowmeisters, there was an in between guy that basically gutted the whole house and just refinished the whole thing, and then put it back on the market as if nothing ever happened. But of course, people ask and they they see the news and things like that. So it's not some type of secret. Yeah. All right. So yeah. Jesse says, okay, what I wanted to say before you unwillingly made me dance like a clown is he continued to pee on things. He pee on his boss's desk and didn't get fired until he peed on a letter to the government. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with peeing on a letter to the government. I think that's perfectly fine behavior. Such a, such <laughs> Encouraged. A move. <laughs> but uh, peeing on your boss's desk is pretty bold. Um, that's uh, th all right. So you do it as a kid, right? You can almost forgive the kid's behavior. It's not like you want, you don't want to like, um, you know, obviously encourage that behavior or even like no. pass it off as not a big deal, Why you not? know, but it's, it's a, well, Rob, because, <laughs> But you can almost like forgive it if it's a kid. You're like, all right, well, he's a kid. He's a, not a necessarily nice kid, but that's, you know, kids do weird things sometimes. Do, uh, I, an adult, do I have to forgive it? Because no, you don't have to forgive it. Because as I recall, I had to throw away all my toys and my toy box, and I had to become an adult at eight years old because my brother ruined my life by peeing on all my things. Right. Maybe forgive it as the. So we just, we don't celebrate kids who behave like that, but it's not the same when an adult behaves like that especially at work and jesse's just saying that they didn't fire him for that they didn't fire him until he peed on the letter to the government so imagine peeing on your boss's desk and not getting fired like, what kind of union <laughs> <laughs> it'd be pretty impressive uh, so let's continue talking about his character a little bit and his marriage was weird as well have you guys read any of like the transcripts of the wife talking to the police yeah. Yeah. And so the one thing that stood out to me that she didn't find, she didn't even find this particularly weird is their entire marriage. They were married for a long time. 25 plus years. And do either of you know how many times they, they had sex? They had sex six times and six they had three children. Times. So imagine. Total. <laughs> total. Yeah. Collect total. I mean, that is, that is a bonker stat. It all, is. Well, overall yes but i mean knowing everything that we know it's it makes a little bit more sense no it, it makes sense but like i'm just saying from the wife's perspective right like how is the wife not so the, it makes the wife a little weird too because like you you don't want to like be intimate why are you married if you don't want to be intimate why is it not weird to you that you that you're not you know i don't know I don't want to get How too, is that not like the deep. biggest red flag of all time? Right? right. But it's a red flag for me on her, too, that she's like, she was just fine with it. Jesse says she also never saw him naked. Yeah, that's true. She never did. That that's, I didn't know. Can we expect that? How does that happen? He just always In just the dark. Either, yeah, dark or just pulled down his pants. Not all the way. And just mm. fully clothed. That's pretty weird. Pretty Very weird. Odd. Very but uh, yeah, that's a serial killer. But yeah, that, like that, that should have been, there should have been several red flags unless she was just like, had like the lowest self-esteem of all time, um, whether it was because of that or, or what, but that's that to me, that should have been a, a red flag. And then you compound that with when they were like, oh, we found a skull on the property and she should have like, she should have taken these two facts only been intimate six times in 25 years. And there's a skull on the property. And I'm like, oh. He's a serial killer, hundred percent. Yep, <laughs> like jump right to that conclusion. <laughs> so. I mean, it's fair. He jumped right on the fact, though, that he was like, "Oh, it was my father's from medical work that he was doing, and I just had to put it back there, pretty much." And she was just like, "Sure, <laughs> just like that's normal." Well, I mean, must must have been invisible from the waist down. <laughs> <laughs> no. Just just very much goes with the rest of this story. So he's supposedly this other killer. They buy this property and now he's going to Indianapolis and going to these bars and picking up these men at bars. I think not even just bars. It seems like he might've been doing it just on the side of the road here and there as well. There was one guy that just went to the store to get like, I think cigarettes and he went missing. And 
this goes back to what we've talked about with serial killers in the past, where if you're not part of like the main population of like people, it doesn't get noticed that you go missing. And it's almost like people don't care. So he's able to keep doing this and doing this and doing this, even in the 1990s, which is just horrific, to be honest. Like, it just sucks that this is something that could happen. It probably still happens today. I mean, I know there was the one in Boston that was happening for a bit um, where men were going missing as well, and they were never able to connect that. But it, it just it, it's terrifying, to be honest. It really is. And uh, you definitely you don't hear a lot about serial killers so much nowadays as you did, you know, 70s, 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder why that is, to be honest. Um, maybe it's tougher now. I mean, of course, it's a lot. It's got to be a lot tougher now with like the advancements in police policing and whatnot. And um, but there just there just aren't as many, which is a good thing. I will say I will say it's well, a good thing. Not to get too deep in the rabbit hole, but a lot of what would probably be serial killers become the spree killers now. And we've talked about there being that whole, you know, in the 1910s, 1920s, the way was axe murder. And then there was the drive by shootings. And then there was, you know, just the regular shooting. Like it just there's there's almost like trends and like the current trend is the spree. Yeah, killer that's true. more more than the serial killer. Although they're still out there and the ones that are good, you're not going to know about for a while. Right. Because right. True. You look at her Bo, Bo What's his last name again? Bo Meister. Bo Meister. What a weird, what a weird name. Anyways, her Bo Meister, you see that he starts to get sloppy in what he's doing because where he's hiding the bodies in the woods, he's putting them deep and deep in the woods. And then by the end, he was, they're getting closer and closer and closer to the property and that's how these guys slip up sometimes and get caught. Yeah. And this is for, so what, him buying this property and his basically his MO changing at that point, assuming that he was the I-70 killer, the timeline makes sense because the time that the I-70 body stopped showing up on the side of I-70 was right around the time that he bought Fox Hollow Farm. Doesn't have to leave the bodies on the side of I-70 now because now he has all this acreage that he can just bury them on. So he, right. just brings, he brings his victims down to his pool in his basement. Which, which is, is awesome. Awesome. Yes. I mean, it's awesome until you surround it with mannequins like a okay. psychopath. Yeah, <laughs> so we well. have to talk about this because this this is alarming. Like this, there's a lot of murder in the story, but the most alarming thing might be these mannequins. Like what? <laughs> what mannequins are terrifying, first of all. They are some of the scariest things ever. I still think one of the scariest pictures you can see is. The pictures from like the 1950s and 60s where the the wax mannequins melting in the storefront windows is terrifying looking. And, and I just can't imagine a going to a pool in a basement and then B, there's just a display of mannequins all around this pool. <laughs> like what? Like that's not your red flag to be like, hey, guys, I got to take off now. You know what his excuse was for having them there when he was asked by that undercover, the dude who went undercover there? It was to, to keep him company. Yeah, because he was lonely. Because he yeah. was lonely. Pretty and, and my brain, I immediately start writing my own horror movie. So I need to timestamp this. This is October 11th, 9.52 p.m. Eastern. In case anyone tries to steal my movie idea. <laughs> I want to make a movie about a serial killer that every time he kills somebody... He sets a mannequin up for them in his like almost like dollhouse that he creates. Like, mm. like he has his own house and he just adds a mannequin for every person that he Or kills. maybe he covers them in wax and turns them into mannequins because that's never been done before, right? Oh gosh. Is that House of Wax? That's House of Wax. Yeah. I'm saying your 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 horror movie idea is too close to House of Wax. It's not I'm too shutting close it down. I'm it's shutting completely it down. Sorry. different. No, because th there's a difference. My movie's better, mine's creepier. Yours is know. better. I've seen both, and yes. <laughs> <I've> seen both. <laughs> Anyways, this is not a horror movie review. That's sad content. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the mannequin's super creepy. Um, and it should have been a red flag. That guy who went undercover was like... Yeah, let's talk about this How guy. far are mm -hmm. you going to go, man? Like you, I mean, I, I get that you want to find it out, but this guy was beyond bold. He was like, I yeah. Mean choke me <laughs> he was supposedly the only one to make it out of that house alive 
like anyone who her brought back never left that house supposedly mm -hmm. so he's the only one that actually went to that house had something happen and made it out which is pretty crazy that he was able to do that and it's just the that the weirdest part of this whole story was when was when he proposed the option of choking him and he's like yes <laughs> Wait, it's like you suspect this guy's a serial killer and you're gonna let him choke you i don't get it that's, that's yeah to me that's that's crazy i think he was he might have been a little too into it and he might have just been changing yeah. the story a little he's like he's like and then he came up to me and he had this hose and he wanted to choke me and i was terrified but i said yes it's like no you if you were terrified you'd be like ah bro i'm gonna i'm gonna pass on the um the hose choking me while i'm in the pool type deal so it, it's just a little far to go when you're quote unquote undercover and you're suspecting him of being a murderer mm. and you're like, mm, I'm going to let him choke me. Let's see yeah. what happens. What's the worst that could happen here? Well, the worst that could happen was he <laughs> dies, <laughs> but he didn't. So lucky for him. And uh, he ended up getting out of there, which is good. But um, he was, uh, he ended up being, so the police ended up, excuse me, police ended up, you know, onto this guy because of this person who went undercover and he was able to provide, he actually, so he ran into him later on and was able to get his license plate and the cops yeah, like, months I later this. Though. Mm -hmm. yeah, a while later. And the cops, uh, the cops at first didn't take him too, too serious. They were like, all right, you're, what are we, what are we supposed to do with this information? You know, until he was able to come back with the license plate. And that's and he when was it supposed all started. To, he was supposed to meet the guy again a week later, like on a Wednesday. Because he dropped them off and he's like, meet me here again next Wednesday. So he went and waited for him and he never showed up. So he was like looking for him for months before he actually caught up with him again. Right. Right. So that was um, pretty wild. And then when the police initially came to his, you know, went to his wife and was like, presented him with the, um, the accusation, presented her with the accusation. She was just like, she wasn't having it. You know, it's kind of, it's weird that she stayed so, uh, like loyal to this guy, even after they, they were even separated at the time and she was still not willing to entertain the idea that he might be a, a killer, even though she found bones in the yard. And to be fair, um, the excuse he gave her wasn't completely baseless because his father actually was an anesthesiologist, was an anesthesiologist. He was some sort of a doctor. And then he, he said that he had bones. So that's why they found them. But um, eventually she came around to the idea that it, it, it could have been him. And, uh, and then, one thing led to another and he ends up we should talk about this where he does alleged suicide because oh, yeah. when he went on to his you know went to where he did and shot himself in the head with a 357 that's a big gun that's a big mess and they didn't find the gun like i meant i was i wanted to ask jesse about this but he's not here to ask but like like because i didn't hear about that from anyone besides jesse so i'm assuming he got it from the book for them not to find the weapon how can you rule that a suicide how? No. Catherine, like would you like to indulge? I mean, I don't know how they ruled it a suicide. Based on everything that the the person that found him pretty much said is that it it was pretty much an entirely staged scene. There was he was basically like he was ready for a funeral, mm -hmm. like in a funeral home. Like he looked like he had makeup on. His hair was like perfectly in place. Um, there was only the gunshot wound on his head. He was on like a sand like altar. So it was very smoothed out. It was kind of mounded as well. It was very put together, almost like a scene created. Mm. Well, what I'd say to that is I saw Fox Crown bring it up in the chat earlier. He wrote a three page suicide note, which is very narcissistic. Yeah, that, that's what Fox Crown pointed out is like this is and we can see narcissistic traits in him just based on stuff that he was doing. So I wouldn't be surprised if he because he like he ends his note with like, I'm going to go eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich now and then I'm going to kill myself. And then I wouldn't be shocked if he set up like if everything that he did in order to to kill himself had to be perfect around him. Now, I can't explain the missing gun. Pull Jesse's that... comment real quick, because this might explain it. So, so Jesse's, Jesse's comment. Says, the theory is someone else was involved in the killings, and he tracked him down and killed him, stole the box of videotapes, and left. So I think that is a pretty interesting theory, but it's, I would, I think it's, 
I don't know because the person who went undercover, right, mm-hmm. to find him, was uh, didn't say anything about a second person, right? Were they killing them together or were they taking turns? You know, because I feel like this person who was okay. Here's the theory: the dude who went undercover was the second killer, and that story was all bogus. He threw it in there to, I don't know. Now you're trying to write a movie, or you're trying to expand upon the movie that I was writing. Mm, because yes. oh what are we gonna that, call this movie? I don't know. We're gonna have it fleshed out by the end of this, but though I think so. More side content. Now you have more side content. We Lots of questions surrounding the death. Suicide, was it homicide? Was it a cover up? Was it staged? Who knows? But we're getting pretty far into this and we haven't mentioned any of the ghosts, really. So I mm. think we should get into the ghosts. Yes. So there's obviously the red shirt ghost with the invisible legs that uh glides um through the trees. Which is pretty scary. Um, and a lot of these ghost stories were um, witnessed by this guy named Joe LeBlanc, who was a friend of the people who own the house now. I don't know if they still own it now or if they were just the people who owned it after. But they um, sold it since. They may have sold it since. But um, so this guy, Joe, he came in to live with the family and uh, he started experiencing some crazy things. One of the crazy things that he experienced was a dream. So He dreamt that he was being chased, and then during the dream, he woke up and didn't realize that he had woke up. He just continued running in real life and Mm -hmm. ran directly into a sliding glass door and smashed it to pieces, which is um, a pretty crazy thing to do. So at first, I'm thinking like, well, this is just he had a bad dream. What does this have to do with a ghost, right? So he was dreaming of the ghost, and there's actually a theory that exists that I think is a pretty interesting theory. And I think it ties into this dream story. So the theory is that your mind is divided into two personalities, your conscious and your unconscious. Um, so while you're um, conscious, obviously you're, that's the dominant one, right? Uh, you're completely in control of your conscious personality while you're awake. And then while you're asleep, your unconscious personality takes over. You're not completely in control of that, but sometimes you remember flashes of it once you're awake again. So an example of this is hypnotism. So your conscious personality is basically put to sleep and your unconscious personality is tapped into. And the theory that pertains to ghosts is that when you die, your conscious personality dies, but your unconscious personality continues to exist with the energy that leaves your body. And this can explain some of the more intelligent hauntings that we see from time to time. Um, So when your dream carries over into reality, like what happened to Joe, that could have been a ghost interfering with his unconscious personality. So that's the um, a very elevator pitch on the theory of the two personalities. That was not an elevator pitch, my friend. You you've been waiting. You've been waiting for Jesse to not be on the show so that you could fill in this filibuster segment where you just see how long you can go. for like a nice 15 minute chunk and you're like this I'm was not gonna let Catherine talk at all tonight this was um well that's not a fair accusation but <laughs> this was so this was there is a, so there is a book on this theory and i just condensed this book into like two minutes all right so that was the best i could do for condensing it um but i think the theory i think it's an interesting theory and i think it's you can explain some of like the dream stuff that happens with Catherine, do you want to react to Dave's 48 chapter book that he just laid out to us? No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually. <laughs> I want to talk about some of these ghosts then. Well, there's like three different parts of the property that are pretty much like the, the main hotspots. It's like the apartment, the pool, pump room, and then like the woods area. I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously, like, the main house, it has the pool in it, obviously. It's in the basement. But most of these, they're really, like, centralized to these three areas, which I can only assume means that that's where the majority of the killings took place, or at least where the they died or something. Mm -hmm. I find one of the things I found real interesting is they thought that the red shirt ghost was trying to lead them to something. And then eventually, I think they found a femur bone which goes with the missing lower half of them. And after they found this bone, the ghost, from what I read, disappeared. I don't know if he's re- reappeared in the in the meantime, but that was a interesting twist. It was sort of like Chillingham Castle, where once the, the body was discovered, the ghost disappeared for a while until it was disturbed again. 
Um, the other part that I find interesting is who was the the guy renting the apartment at the at the house? What was his name again, Dave? I don't have it in front of me. The wife's okay. name was Vicky. Well, there was Vicky and Rob, Robert Graves, but the guy, the other guy with his dog. Oh, Joe, was, uh, Joe LeBlanc. Sorry. Yeah, Joe LeBlanc. So he he was staying at the house, and they said that he might have actually been causing some of the the spiritual activity because he was a young single man living on his own. So here's a young single man in this property, and they think that the ghost of the killer might have actually been you know, going after him in a way because that would have been like his type of victim. So you think it could be the ghost of the killer? Yeah. The, so there was an EVP one time where they were asking who the ghost was, and he said the married one. And mm -hmm. if all the people that died there were never married, the only one that was married was the killer. So he could still be the one that's on the property. Yeah, I did hear about that. That's an interesting one. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, we have a question here. Stephanie asked, wasn't Joe LeBlanc on Friends? Very close. Very close. Matt Matt LeBlanc, right? But yeah. his character yeah. was Joey. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So that's that makes um, a lot of sense. Thanks. He can be the lead in our uh, horror movie with the mannequins. <laughs> I don't know about that. We have to we have to talk about casting later. I don't know if I agree with that decision. All right, fair. fair. I just figured because he's here. It was convenient. <laughs> what else did you uh, find when you were researching this case, Catherine? Um, there's just a lot of different like sites and like the Joe LeBlanc saw the majority of the activity. The mm -hmm. wife, um, Mrs. Graves saw a lot outside, yep. but never really, I mean, she said that she heard things inside of the house, but never really like witnessed a whole lot inside of the house. She just had stories of basically what Joe saw. Um, and, and her, her husband went on to say that they had been married for decades before they bought this house. And she had never brought up anything paranormal. She had never like said that she saw a ghost or anything until this stuff started happening in this house, which really like makes you like, you know, be like, oh, there might be something here because it's it's really hitting her on this one. Yeah. And even when she first saw the the red shirt man with no no legs, she didn't mention it to him because she had seen him out of the corner of her eye. She wanted to go see who it was and she obviously he had vanished into thin air and she was just like, Oh, I, it, I must've been seeing things. And then she saw it a second time and she's like, Hey, I've seen this before. Like mm -hmm. there's a man in the red shirt with a red shirt in the woods. And yep. her husband was able to, to kind of talk her down and say like, Oh, it's probably just people trying to see like the house that the serial killer lived in. And she was like, well, he didn't really have legs. So <laughs> probably not, but Okay. Such an interesting tidbit for that ghost, too, that it, it's missing a lower half. And Stephanie brought up in chat earlier, maybe there was a lot of trauma to the to the lower half of the body. And that's why. But if he's so we don't know what he was doing with these victims after he strangled them. There's no evidence that he was doing anything he was, to he them. Was dismembering them. Well, he was. Yeah, it's a good point. So obviously so. he's dismembering them. So valid. So maybe he right. started with the legs. Maybe. Maybe that's how you end up with a, a legless haunting mm. and burning them, Jesse says. He was burning them, true. Yes. yes. Um, the knocking. The knocking on the door constantly is terrifying. Be Jesse sent me the uh, audio for the, his this um, <laughs> opening segment, so I was listening to it while I was working on my house, and I had my ladder up, and I'm up on the ladder up on the second story, and I'm working right next to a wall, like right, the wall's right by my right ear, and I'm listening to the audio he sent me, and all of a sudden, I get the banging. Of course, he puts it just in one ear to mess with me. <laughs> and I just, I, it just sounded like somebody was banging on the other side of this second story wall, which made no sense. Almost fell off the ladder. It was terrifying. It was the most terrifying part of this episode. I would have been oh, yeah, very close far. to having this show to myself again, and that would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I almost had a heart attack at work today when I heard it. I was just <laughs> sitting at work and all of a sudden a giant knock in my ear and I jumped out of my skin. I was like, oh God, what was that? I was I was driving to watch Terrifier 2 with Dave when I listened to the audio for this. And yeah, it almost sent me out of my out of my window uh, on the ride. But that that would be terrifying because this house particularly, 
like this is a mansion. It is literally a mansion, and it is set away from everything. So the only people that could have been doing this are the other people that live there, which is the the couple that he was renting from, and they weren't doing it. Like it just it didn't it wasn't them, and he would just open the door, and there'd be nothing there, and then he close it, and the banging would get progressively worse. Which I don't know, man. Like that's that's some scary stuff that I just yeah, don't really want to deal with. And then even one day he said that the knocking was getting progressively louder and he opened the door and it was still knocking and he watched the knocker right from the top fall all the way down. Yeah. And that no was one was there. Yeah, that's that is absolutely terrifying. And the pool there there he brought a friend to the house. And they went down to the pool and he had been telling the friend about everything that was happening. And his friend was kind of like, eh, whatever. I don't really believe you. I think you're just playing into the story type of deal. And then I can't remember if it was him or the friend, but one of them got pushed in the back and then like slightly choked and like pushed underwater almost. And they could just tell by the look on the face of the other one that they weren't, they weren't fooling around like it was legitimately happening and they were both terrified from this experience yeah that i heard i did hear that one and that one's pretty pretty scary you say that was a um during an investigation right no i think it was leblanc from what i oh, was remember it? yeah it was LeBlanc. leblanc brought a friend over maybe i maybe i'm mixing this up but i was pretty sure that joe leblanc brought a friend over and was telling him everything that happened and then they went to swim in the pool and then this this situation happened and at that point you got to leave yeah like you, you just like if you really think something's pulling you underwater in the pool and like you got this constant knocking at your door it's it's time to it's time to go <laughs> like you just got to get out of there yeah 100% 100% so um other haunting so vicky has a story which I don't know about this one, but she said she was vacuuming and the cord kept unplugging itself. So she's mm -hmm. vacuuming the, the rug, vacuum shuts off. And she's like, what's going on? The cord's unplugged. She walks back over, plugs it back in, happens again a few minutes later. Third time it happens, she wraps it up and she's too freaked out. So I assume this was more than her just testing the boundaries of the cord and seeing how far it could stretch because, yeah. you know, for you to assume that something is being unplugged by some sort of, you know, um, force, then you're not going to you know right right she, she's not like at the corner of the room like balancing the yeah <laughs> the vacuum on the cord like i wonder how much further i can go right now and then she's like yeah. must be a ghost i got it pulled out so far i'm guessing she's pretty close to the outlet turning around plugging it in and by the time she turns back around it's it's already unplugged yeah exactly well, yeah so that's seems like, like a normal a... thing if you're vacuuming right. and it comes out of the wall, you automatically are like, all right, well, I can't go that far anymore. So if it keeps happening. Yeah. Right. Cause you don't, you want to get the whole rug happens. without having to unplug the plug and move it to a closer outlet. So you're just stretching it out, but I've never, you know, blamed that on a ghost. Jesse says, well, the end of that story, she said she stood still and watched the plug get yanked out of the wall. I just, I, I just kind of want Jesse to leave. Story, I just I heard that part of the story. I would have included it. You know, maybe, maybe just go back to vacation, Jesse. Like yeah. just don't don't throw a don't throw an episode at us and then you know dictate stuff from the comments. Yeah, you're just fired. Fired. He has to be the center of attention, though. He does. <laughs> he does, and he is, of course. And he is, yeah. as always. Yes. Um, is there any more hauntings we wanted to get into on this? We covered all the ones that I want to talk about, unless Catherine has some extra. Spicy well, the, hauntings. Well, the wet man in all white that ran into Joe LeBlanc's apartment. Oh, do tell. Yeah. So one day he was just in his apartment and all of a sudden he turns around and there's this guy soaking wet um, with his eyes wide full of terror. He's soaking wet, all, dressed in all white. He runs into the bedroom and Joe's just kind of like, who is that? So he tries to follow him into the bedroom to figure out who this man is, why he's so scared, what's going on. And he goes into the bedroom and there's nobody. There nice. was just All right, that an apparition. That's that is... a great one. And it makes sense because if you get a person who's dripping wet, maybe it was somebody who was killed in the pool, the ghost mm. of somebody, you know, killed in the pool. That's that's a good one. I didn't I didn't hear about that one. 
I didn't I didn't hear about that one either. So that's that's a, a real interesting one. Another one that's like specific to this story too. You know, like like I mentioned right. earlier, you get the guy with the red shirt was specific to somebody who was seen leaving the bar, and I get the guy with the white dripping wet shirt who could have been the victim of somebody in the pool. So there's that's too it's weird to see that many, you know, in a one one haunting. And like we said, they were open for a while to actually having paranormal teams come in and investigate after everything was going on. And some teams did catch some very compelling EVPs. The married one is probably the most prominent of all of these EVPs. But there was activity captured on camera. Do you have, is any of the video available? You can. There's like the Ghost Adventures episode. There's a couple other ones. I found a an hour long documentary where they're interviewing people that her Bowmeister worked with as well as like the owners of the house currently and did an investigation there as well. I wasn't able to finish that entire thing to see exactly what they captured. Uh, mm. But it there is quite a bit of content out there. But I don't think you're allowed to go anymore. I, I think a new family owns the house now and it is. Uh, and they don't want any part of it, I guess. Exactly. Mm, so do sense. we do we have any closing thoughts on either Herb Bowmeister himself or the hauntings? I think Herb was a jerk. Not a good guy. Oh, I, I question his character, you know? Good job, Dave. Thanks. We're, we're all proud of you. Catherine? I mean, it I mean, it makes sense why this place would be haunted. There's just so many victims and it's all pretty much confirmed. And there could be way more than what they found even now they're still finding stuff it seems um or at least in the documentaries i've i saw which were a couple years ago but either way they're still finding stuff still trying to find stuff right so i don't yeah. i don't think this is i don't think this is going away I, again i find the most compelling part of this being a case from the 90s mostly and it being so prominently haunted and such a short amount of time like that's that's what i find prominent like so different from this one than other things that we cover in the past that obviously wasn't coming from my from my microphone rob <laughs> yeah well i thought it was you because you're you're all messed up on camera because you it's are 10, all messed 15, up. and that's what happens at 10 15 dave starts to starts to go into a vortex start to materialize it, look, it looks like he gets held underwater for the for the rest of the show at this point. <laughs> all right. So what I want to do real quick is I want to thank all of our patrons, which our VIPs are Jimmy Randall Hibbs, Justin, Justin T, Lisa J, Mom and Pop Wilkins, Stephen V, and newly Demon King 666. I want to thank all of you for being VIP members. And then to the rest of our patrons, we have Jake V, Mike B, Stephanie A, Sydney B, Anthony Angry Dave Rocks T, Brandon W, Captain McSlugs, Cody G, Carolee J, Mark M, Matthew T, Mariah M, Papa Squatch, Rachel B, Sarah R, which is Dave Loves Bacon, Sarah Wilson, Sophia Martini. I just said her whole name. Sorry about that. So Sarah, also Sarah Wilson's too. Oh, I just, you know, I read. I it's a teleprompter. I read what's on the teleprompter and just spit it out but there I'm, rob that's a, I'm rob coakley and that is all of our patreon members and again you get a lot of extra perks especially this month our history of ghost series i find one of the most interesting things we do where we pick a specific ghost and we talk about the origins of this type of ghost and talk about the history behind such like an onrio or a banshee and you get to learn a lot about just a specific ghost which um it was quite a learning experience for me, either researching the episode or just listening to the ones you or Jesse did. Was that a question? I was just going to let you expand upon it, but you know, it's tough to tell oh. what you're going to do when you're Sorry. underneath the water right now. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't expecting you to toss something to me at this point at the in the show, but uh, <laughs> right. but yeah, uh, we do have a five star review that I wanted to read, so let's. Uh, I'm going to pull that up real quick as well. And I just want to say thank you to everyone that has been leaving us reviews on Apple iTunes. It helps us out tremendously. Leave a five-star review. You write something out on a five-star review, we will read it. 
But I also noticed that Spotify, our reviews have been going up quite a bit on that. And we have a new one that popped up. So I'm going to read the one from CJ the Conqueror first. It says, love the show. I stumbled on the show when I was driving across the country and my daughter came with me and wanted to hear some scary stories. We found this podcast and now we both listen every time we're in the car. Love how in-depth you guys get and always love getting a good chill from the stories. Keep up the great work. Love hearing that uh, father and daughter are bonding over the show. That's really cool. And then we have one from K Kelly 88 um, I have not read this one yet, so hopefully nothing is bad in it. And it's titled One of the Best Haunted Podcasts. I've been searching for a great haunted podcast for a while now, and I'm so glad I found Hometown Ghost Stories. The guys keep me interested and entertained and provide great information. Love this podcast. So thank you for that review as well. Um, I like how you're like, I can't, I hope nothing bad is in this because if it is, I'm just going to read it because I have no control <laughs> over what I'm reading out loud. <laughs> this is what I do. This is what I do. I'm just going to read it. Um, I also want to thank the town of Bridgewater. We, on Saturday night, Jesse, Dave, and myself went and we did a 25 minute, uh, I don't want to say lecture, but we, we just had like a, a talk. We were part of a ghost tour where we presented um, the story of Bridgewater from my grandparents' house, episode one. If you haven't gone back and listened to episode one, we told that story to a group of people, kind of talked about the podcast a bit, and everyone was real receptive. And I wanted to thank Bridgewater for having us to do that and everyone that sat there and listened to us and didn't leave. So that was fun. Nobody got up and walked out. And that was kind of the barometer I was going for on that. Yep. That was a good time. That was a fun experience. So definitely would want to do that again. Yeah, we are looking at doing more live events in the future. Um, other than that, you're going to be able to catch us on Talk is Jericho in the next month or two. We recorded that last week. But that's kind of everything I have. Anything you wanted to, to say, Catherine, before we get out of here? No. Thanks for letting me be Jesse for the day. Sorry I couldn't be as much of a show hog as he is, but uh, – <laughs> I did it's, do my best. It's fine. Dave came in. He did that 30-minute filibuster and pretty much leveled out the show for, for the rest of the time. It was, it was I had good. one brief monologue where I shared my thoughts on some ghost theory. Okay. It's not, is it is it so much to ask? Yeah, it actually is so much to ask. Anything you wanted to end the show with, Dave? Please try to keep it under 30 minutes. Yeah, I just want to uh take a few minutes of your time to talk about this other ghost theory. I have. I'm just kidding, I don't. No, that's it. <laughs> <clears throat> all right everyone we wanted to thank you for joining us and remember if you're listening to us on itunes or something you can join us every tuesday night at 9 p.m eastern live on youtube where you can interact with our chat it is always always a fun experience as you can tell so for myself Catherine, um underwater dave the mannequin and <laughs> jesse wilkins from the beyond we want to thank you for joining us and we will catch you next time peace What's up, everyone? Rob from Hometown Ghost Stories here. Just wanted to thank you for watching this week's episode. Unless you fast forwarded to this part, which would be super weird, you should rewind the whole thing, watch the episode from the beginning, get back to this part so that I can tell you, you should leave a comment below. Let us know what you thought of this place. Also, jump over to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Leave us a comment on that as well. We will read it at the end of the episode like you just heard unless you did that psychopathic thing where you watched this part first. Anyways, timeline's getting all confused. Rate, review, that's what we're looking for. Thanks for joining us here at Hometown Ghost Stories.